I'm going to talk about a project which I initiated um, some years ago, and um, now it's an open source project since uh, March, and it's called NeuroKernel. <clears throat> Uh, the focus of our work is on fruit flies. And um, the reason is uh, simple, somewhat similar to what Steve mentioned here about C. elegans. Uh, but there are some differences. Uh, one difference is that um, uh, while the network of neurons in the brain is uh, fairly small, maybe 100,000, some people believe it's maybe 150,000, so somewhere in between, um, the fly has a range of complex uh, behaviors, which are very interesting, and they are very, very well understood in the literature. And uh, in addition, of course, there is a very powerful tool gen of genetic techniques, which can be applied to the fly. And this um, was one of the reasons why, actually, I got into this field. Um, this slide, very briefly, uh, tells you what we are trying to do. On the right-hand side, you have the real fly. Uh, on the left-hand side is the model of it, and we would like to emulate it. And the emulation I'm going to talk, talk about today is on the brain level, but there are some people who are interested to do more than that, um, as far as maybe even uh, build a robot insect. Now, um, there is a lot of data available in the literature about the fly, and I'm showing here some data uh, which came out of the lab of Chang in, in Taiwan, um, whereby a mesoscale model of the fruit fly uh, has been established and is being established right now. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, you see a um, depiction of the brain. Uh, what you see there in green in the middle is the antenna lobe. So there are two lobes, left and right, and then at the, on the sides, let's say, the medulla. And there are a lot of uh, neural pills, roughly uh, 40 in the brain. Uh, and this has been established using genetic techniques, and the level of abstraction is mesoscale. So one has a very good sense about the neurons and their morphology, but one doesn't know too much about synap synapses and connectivity. On the right-hand side, however, you see the, the mesoscale connectivity. These are the tracts. So this picture gives you a sense of one point of view in um, looking at the architecture of the brain. Another point of view is what Mitya talked about yesterday, whereby one uses basically electron microscopy. And uh, of course, this produces a lot of data. The work is much more tedious in a sense. Uh, it's much slower, but uh, the general lab he uh, led um, came up with a connectome both for the lamina and for the medulla. And uh, so this is something very interesting for us. It's a subsystem, if you like. Uh, but I'm going to show you some data about uh, how this is used in building an architecture. And finally, uh, there is a lot of electrophysiology being done in the fly. And I'm showing here an example from my lab. Uh, this is electrophysiology done uh, on the olfactory system. So we are um, <clears throat> recording here uh, olfactory sensor neurons. You see on the top, there's a time-dependent waveform with various concentrations. In the middle, there are a set of trials uh, shown in different colors. And the reason is because actually these experiments, they're extraordinarily difficult, uh, contrary to uh, intuition. And the reason is because auto delivery is actually an art. This is the first demonstration, actually, that one can provide auto delivery within 1% precision, so that actually the data which comes out of the neurons uh, is uh, precise. And this is an example over there. Uh, so essentially, there are various levels of attacking the problem from a neurobiology standpoint. And there is a lot of data. And now we ask the question, um, how to go about modeling? And the first step is neurobiology modeling in terms of the neural peels and the abstract languages, these are local processing units, which consist of local neurons and projection neurons. Projection neurons extend their axons to other LPUs, uh, whereas local neurons are local, and their uh, axons do not leave the neural peel. Uh, there are roughly 40 LPUs, and um, 
they provide either spiking information or sp spike train or a graded potential. Uh, for instance, that's the case in vision. Now, uh, so this was my hat of a uh, neurophysiologist, if you like. So now I'm going to put on my hat of a computer engineer. And so I start with requirements. This is a standard st starting point in uh, building a um, emulator. And so what are the requirements? So the requirements we have here, one is scaling. We have to be able to scale the system as time passes by. And um, this scaling has to be not just in terms of uh, <clears throat> the modeling gets more and more detailed, but also the um, resources on which we are running the system uh, might be more uh, larger and therefore we have to do sort of a scaling across uh, hardware platforms. And um, we believe that, um, and this is sort of a point of view coming out of neurobiology, we believe that the most complex object we can build in computer science is an operating system and most likely uh, the fly brain is more complex than an operating system. So at the minimum what we have to do is apply an operating system concept or operating system concept to attack the problem. So uh, here is a difference now, um, if you like, from what has been done in the past because we are looking at all this as being an operating system and uh, the message I have as a result is that there are three important things in this field. Uh, programmability, programming models, uh, programming models and programming models. So similar to, you know, what people say in real estate, location, 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 we say everything is about programming models. And so what I'm going to discuss is actually programming models at, at various levels of abstraction. In particular, I'm going to talk about the architectural level, uh, but I'm going to also talk about programming abstraction on the LPU level. So start with LPU. The um, abstract language which we are using is that the LPU is an abstraction which has input and output ports. Uh, the output neurons which extend their axons to the output, to these output ports, or they are connected to the output ports, if you like. And then there are local neurons which are only for the LPU domain and they don't know anything about uh, anything outside the LPU. So, uh, for simplicity, in particular for those of you who are some coming to this from biology, this looks like a chip. So let's say, pick your favorite chip, let's say an Intel chip, and an Intel chip has input-output ports and has logic in it. The logic here comes from local neurons. Uh, so now what we have to do is, if we have chips, we would like to build actually, let's say, a computer board or a PC. That requires define some interfaces, standard interfaces, so that these things can be put together. So that's, this is what drives us towards a programming model. So you see, what I have here is two LPUs, LPU0 and LPU11. I like to interconnect them. And so I look at LPU0, it consists of essentially a switch matrix, which is in gray. Uh, and then I have in blue projection neurons with ex which extend their um, <clears throat> axons to the output and I have local neurons. And somehow they're interconnected to the switch fabric inside. So it's, if you like, you call it switch fabric if you're a computer engineer, connectivity if you're a biologist, I guess. And then there is a need for an, ob an object which interconnects the LPUs and this is here a pattern and that's also switch fabric. So it, it provides essentially connectivity between input and output ports. And so fundamentally what we have here is um, a set of toys, if you like. This set of toys are LPUs and patterns. And what we have to do is mesh them together any way we want to so we come up with an architecture of interest, in this case for the fruit fly brain. Now, so the programming model therefore is one of on the level of the architecture, okay, is one of mix and play. So again, the way to think about it is you have a computer board, you have chips on it, you have a bus, you can read and write on the bus. The reads and writes are according to an API. So what we have to do here as a result, publish an API, which people have to abide to, and then the design of the LPU, LPUs is completely independent. 
which means that various labs can design their own LPUs according to their own criteria. They don't have to follow any rules, if you like, but they have to abide by the APIs, and that allows us to do uh, cooperative uh, work. So you see, the collaborative model, therefore, is one based upon, and this is the main message I'd like to give you today, on communication interfaces, APIs. The APIs are between LPUs, if you like, between LPUs and the patterns, or more generally, a set of interfaces which allow you to essentially separate the innards of the LPU from the outside world, and this is essential in, in, in program development. Uh, it allows uh, collaborative development and refinement of emulations. Uh, it allows researchers to leverage additional GPU resources and enables in vivo validation of the neural kernel. Now, so how did we go about this? We set up a website called Neural Kernel. Um, here's the HTTP address. And it's based on RFCs. We have four, in, in the language Steve presented here with a bazaar, we are following the Linux model, the bazaar, and we uh, essentially uh, invite the community to submit RFCs to the website. And together, RFCs together with code. RFCs in the commun computer science community are as good as papers. Uh, actually, some people think they're better. They're more valuable, okay, because they have direct impact. And so we are asking people to submit RFCs and code, which then can be discussed. So this, of course, is publicly as, uh, accessible. Uh, RFCs might be, might, might be superseded with new RFCs because of improvements. Um, and at the same time, they're, they're going to have sort of some validity because there's going to be some agreement, presumably, about uh, the best RFCs, and so that actually the architecture be, can be moved forward. So here, uh, quickly, uh, here's the website. Let's see if, if I go to documents. Uh, there are requests for comments there, and there are two RFCs, so we published RFCs. Now, this is essentially against, swimming against the stream in neuroscience, because we are publishing the stuff, and we are not waiting you know, for approval, if you like, and we are sharing the information with other people. And it's exactly how Linux was developed, it's exactly how the internet was built. Okay? We think that this is a model um, which is very valuable, because you know, when you submit your RFC, your name appears not only in the code, but it also appears on a document, uh, it's also clear in terms of you know, publications, who publishes what. Uh, there are names associated with this, and here is a start for this. Okay. Presumably... My file is here. Now, my message is, as I said, Interfaces, open interfaces, open APIs, this is about openness here. Now, uh, <clears throat> the picture is more complex. This model, which I described before, actually appears on the application plane. This is what a Python programmer sees. This is what it deals with. But from a system standpoint, and I'm talking about now pure computer engineering, essentially this has to be mapped into computational resources. And uh, we feel that today, especially for small labs, the most uh, price competitive solution is to use GPUs in an architecture whereby the GPUs appear at the bottom, they operate on the fastest time scale, then there's a CPU time scale which operates slower, and on the top you have the LPUs. So you see, this is a classical model for operating systems in the sense that uh, the Underlying infrastructure, CPUs and GPUs, they provide a set of services. In other words, the system is an extended machine, which on the top provides the services. This is where you run your brain emulation. This is where the LPUs are. This is where the patterns are. And at the same time, it provides the second feature, which is resource allocation. Um, and this resource allocation is, is guaranteed through the CPUs. 
uh, which control the resource allocations on the GPUs. And this is of interest in particular if you want to uh, deal with things like real time and interconnecting you know, your uh, architecture with the actual fly. Now, um, in terms of uh, specifics now, so on the architectural level I said the issue is open up interfaces, publish them, uh, work with these interfaces, define the LPUs any way you want to. Now we started looking into the LPUs uh, and specifically our interest is in LPUs associated with the, the vision system and with olfaction. And uh, Mitya talked about the, the vision system, so I'm, I'm going to spend some time on it, although, uh, strictly speaking, the olfactory system is closer to me. Uh, so, in the vision system, what we have here is five LPUs. It starts with the red uh, part, which is the retina, then the next is lamina, medulla, and lobula, lobula plate. So, these are LPUs, um, and now, um, in a sense, the question is, um, from a um, computer engineering standpoint, how can we deal with this? We need programming abstractions, we need a programming model. We have to be able to actually deal with this somehow. Okay? Uh, a flat structure where you have a lot of neurons is too low level for us. We need circuits to manipulate. Okay? Uh, we feel, and I think this is a main message, as soon as you look at uh, programming abstractions, you need something higher level than neurons. And so uh, here is, I just go quickly through. I start with the retina. You see the retina consists of um, basically omatidia. They are sort of uh, facets. Each one has six plus two neurons. Or, uh, photoreceptors, six black and white, two color. And they are organized in a beautiful uh, geometry, sort of hexagonal uh, geometry. What you see here on the left is a receptor. It has 30,000 microvilli. This is where the transduction process takes place. In, in implementation, that means that you have actually 30,000 groups of 20 to 30 differential equations, which you have to uh, run if you have light or some video coming. And then uh, the output is driven by a hodgkin huxley neuron type of model uh, whereby everything is analog, so everything is graded potentials. Now, uh, if you see, see on the right there, there is, an, there is a circle denoted by A. This is like sort of the input to the next level, to the, the lamina, to a cartridge. And the input is to this cartridge comes from this R1 to R6 neurons from its neighborhood. And uh, there are roughly 800 omatidia, okay, so 800 times 8 neuron roughly. That's the um, numerical complexity on the level of retina. When you go to the, la uh, to the lamina, you get this circuit with the inputs coming from the retina, and uh, there are some outputs. This connectivity, we use the data published uh, by, by Janelia, and you see now we started looking at a programming model whereby we think about that here are omatidia, and the cartridges are tubes, and then there, there are going to be later on columns in the middle of their tubes too. These are the programming abstractions. They are doing their circuits which do local processing. Uh, and so this is what is represented there. And so this is very natural because we have a visual space which essentially is sampled okay, through these circuits. But at the same time, there has to be some lateral connectivity because images move across the a visual space, and so there is connectivity among these um, abstractions. So while you can look at them to be independent, you know, in the first instance, th then as a whole, you see that the programming model consists of the cartridges as objects, and then rules of composition among those. And the rules of composition then help whether you are going to recognize, you know, an object uh, better or not. Um, the next level is um, the medulla. And the medulla, again, has a, a similar structure in terms of these uh, abstractions. And the uh, interconnects between them, there are a lot of different types of neurons involved. Uh, the number of neurons is different, et cetera, et cetera. So now I'd like to give you a demonstration so that you get a sense of what we're doing. So here's the uh, picture of the retina. So this is a half sphere. And you see the hexagons, those are stand for the omatidia. So as I said before, six neurons are in there, black and white, two for color. 
the black and white neurons feed the lamina directly. Um, and so what it's interesting here for us is to look at if there is an input, there is an image, and in this case is a set of bars moving across the screen. So think about a flat screen. The bar is moving across it. One has to map it into this uh, hemisphere. And you're going to see on the left the hemisphere is moving. And then we look at the output of the retina. Specifically, we are looking at the R1 neurons. And um, obviously, how many are there? There are 768, because there are 768 omatidia. On the right-hand right side, you'll see the simulation starts a little bit later, because there is a natural delay. So what you see in, here on the left is what the retina sees, and what you see on the right is what you know, the rest of the brain sees, okay? In other words, behind the retina. And so here is the simulation. And you see, um, this is, of course, graded potentials. It pretty much follows this, the input. And of course, you have that six times. So if you think in terms of uh, super resolution, of course, the, the quality is going to be much better. I'm finishing this, OK? And um, this is the first image. And now the next one is here. And here, we are showing now the entire system where we also include the medulla, and we are picking some medulla neurons. Uh, and you see from the left, from the top, we have visual input. Then we are looking at the, what does the output of the retina provide in terms of information. Then we're looking at the lamina, okay, and we are sampling various neurons in the medulla, and we are showing this. So what is the message here? Uh, we think that this is not about Simulation is not about differential equations. Simulation is about information. So we are, we are bringing in, essentially, information. And we think that things are shifting towards this, whereby you know, we have a circuit. We have to demonstrate what is the I.O. capability, what can it do. And that's exactly what you're seeing here. Um, and uh, since Angus um, is hinting that it's the end of it, um, let me stop here. Um, However, I would like just to say that we believe that the fundamental challenge we have is what has been discussed before, is validation, biological validation. The issue is not validation uh, in the computer science sense, it's validation in the biological sense. And that requires basically connecting the emulator to the real thing in the lab and seeing you know, whether there is any uh, convergence between the two. Thank you. Questions? Um, <clears throat> you you uh, describe these local processing units as, as modules which uh, you sort of independently can contribute. Uh, at the same time, you had uh, uh, different uh, layers uh, where the actual processing occurs, like the GPU layer. So uh, I guess that means that, that the, the API for such a local processing unit is not that uh, slim, but, but in fact uh, must have rather um, rich set of methods to, to describe such a local processing unit. And you're not completely free to uh, divide up how you do the computation, right? Yeah, so um, the message I have here is this. Uh, I believe that the priority for us, from an informatics standpoint, is programmability, is function. And I have seen this over many years in the internet. What won out was functionality. Uh, we can take care of performance. There are a lot of geeks in this room, I, I included. I don't think it's a problem. But it's true that since this is an operating system, uh, you have two functions. One is programmability, and the other one is resource allocation. And you have to take care of both. And the issue is, for us here, I believe, to hide everything which has to do with the research, research allocation and focus on programmability. Now, the way I went about this was, 
first of all, I moved from CPUs to GPUs. So, you know, from traditional CPU clusters to uh, GPU clusters. And the reason is because then in no time, I got a performance advantage and I did not have to focus on performance. I had to focus on functionality and I believe that this is where the action is. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of this uh, because essentially the history of computer science is tells us that while there is a lot of focus on performance, we do this because we are geeks, but not because Moore's law is not taking care of it. And uh, so, you know, um, uh, in the presentation, uh, Felix said on, on, I guess, what was it, Monday, Tuesday? Uh, basically, what we have seen is that uh, computer power is going up, and um, so I'm not too concerned about it. I'm, I'm, I feel that we, we can take care of this. It's not saying that it's a free lunch there. I'm not, I'm not suggesting this, but I'm suggesting that if we want to make a difference, it's all about biology. Okay, that's, that's the feeling I have, and this is where I'm coming from at this, okay? So obviously I'm very much influenced by the fact that, you know, I'm looking at data in the lab, and I would like to be able to explain it. And uh, now I have here, for vision I demonstrated, a, um, a running system, okay? It's ex executable, executable in the sense of I.O., and I can change it now any way I want to because I have a programming model to do so. Right. No, no I, I very much believe in introducing more interfaces in computational neuroscience. If we compare to uh, traditional computational science, uh, they typically uh, uh, divide the work into uh, more independent pieces of software than we do we, in, in computational neuroscience. We typically have rather monolithic softwares. So I do believe uh, that we need more interfaces. Okay, thank you. Are there what? any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Somewhat along the same lines, I mean, are you aware of um, some of the more recent asynchronous task-based programming models the computer scientists come up with, like Parallax or what Barcelona Supercomputing Center does, uh, uh, STARS S? Um, because essentially what they are, I mean, they, they, they look very much more generic than the neural kernel model you're proposing in the sense that they actually allow programmers to describe any sort of function and sort of data dependencies and then allow the runtime to schedule it on whether it's the CPU, GPU, or whatever other heterogeneous kernel you have. So I mean, in that sense, it seems that um, there's at least duplication, or do you think there's a... No, no, no. I, I'm very familiar with this. I, I, I spent 20 years in, in computer networks, and I, I, I actually build this, you know, I build, uh, you know, network programming into, into you know, networks. Essentially, the problem is, if you look at the internet, you have on the high level, on the, uh, let's say, packet switch level, you have an asynchronous system, which is mapped into a synchronous hierarchy, because at the low level, you have a clock. And those problems are already there in the internet. We have the same problem here, because unfortunately, we don't have hardware which is clock independent. And so the GPU is driven by clock, and we have to sort of, we have a counter, and you know, so on the high level, we think about, let's say, uh, spikes, and spikes are completely asynchronous events, and then we have to map that to down into hardware which is, you know, clock-based. We don't have a choice. Maybe uh, if some folks, you know, uh, develop some new hardware, we can avoid this. There's not going to be a way to avoid this uh, without it. Not in the next, in my opinion, 10 years. There's no way to go around this. Okay, uh, and by the way, I don't even think that it's a good idea to avoid it because um, essentially, there is a community of probably one million engineers out there who are developing all this stuff, and we just we just we should just suck it up, okay, and use it, okay. And this is what I'm banking on also in this GPU development here. Uh, remember, I had this picture at the low level. I had GPUs. Now that means basically that I have direct memory transfer between GPUs. It's not working properly yet but it's going to work properly. It has not been designed for that. Typically, from the GPU, you have to go up to the CPU, and then you go down to G GPU again, and it slows you down. What you want is memory transfer from GPU to GPU. In other words, you want to look at GPUs like routers in the internet, okay? And they talk directly. And then the CPU layer just appears as a control layer, takes care of connectivity, and you know, doesn't care about the details. 
So it's a point of view.